Um, I'm Nadia Polgarkova. I'm an assistant professor at UC San Diego, and uh, my research areas are program synthesis and program verification. And I'm really excited uh, to speak to you today uh, because obviously you're the future of program languages. Um, okay, so why did I decide to talk about um, constraint solvers, and in particular statins and T-solvers, today? Um, so, as, uh, if you're following PO research and um, reading papers, reading PO papers, you probably noticed that more and more papers over the years have um, in them uh, a sentence like, we use this as a T-solver as the backend. Right? We use this constraint solve. We encoded our problem as constraints and just gave it to the solver. Right? So um, in the past uh, uh, couple of decades, sadness and T-solvers uh, became basically ubiquitous and are used in uh, hardware verification. They are used in software verification and bug finding uh, in tools such as uh, CLI, uh, Liquid Haskell, or Daphne, for example. Um, they're used in software synth and program synthesis and uh, program repair. Um, if you know tools like Sketch, uh, Leon, Syncred, or Rosette, for example. But um, they are now even powering sort of uh, less traditional areas, such as um, solvers are used to um, synthesize network, network configurations and firewalls. They're used for biological modeling and even to design buildings. There was this really cool talk, I believe a strange move last year, about how to use uh, SMT solvers for architecture. So basically my point here is that this is a really mature technology that is extremely versatile and it's really right for you know, being applied to uh, different domains. And uh, so if you are, um, a PO researcher, this really almost became like one of those skills, like how to write a paper or how to give a talk, you know, how to use an SMT solver. And uh, if you're not doing it in your research, then you might be missing out. So it's good, it, it's something that's uh, good for everyone to know. All right, so that's why I decided to talk, to talk about this. Um, so before um, I tell you about, you know, what those things are and how to use them, um, can I just get a show of hands of how many of you have used um, sadness and solvers before in your work. Okay, so many of you have, but some of you have not, so I hope this talk will still be useful to someone um, in this room. All right, so what are these, uh, uh, what are these SAT and S&T acronyms, right? So SAT is, um, stands for Buoyant Satisfiability, right? So SAT solvers can, uh, so what they do is, um, they find satisfying assignments for propositional formulas, right? And a propositional formula is just like a fancy word for a Boolean expression with, uh, you know, Boolean variables and logical operators, like and or. So we can use those Boolean constraints or propositional formulas to encode some real world problems, like I walk into a bar and I want to get a drink, and the only two drinks they have are gin and tonic, right? So I have to get gin or tonic, right? But um, so uh, what I also know is that if I'm a minor, I cannot get gin. And also, let's say I know that I am a minor, and I can give this to a SAT solver, and then it will solve my problem for me and tell me what drink to get, right? It will tell me, OK, given this formula, it actually, the only satisfying assignment here is that minor is true, <coughs> gin is false, and tonic is true, right? Because I'm a minor, so I can't get a gin, but I have to get one of the two, so I have to get one. Okay. Um, so this is all well and good, but um, so where does this SMT come in? What does this SMT stand for? So SMT stands for Satisfiability Modular Theories. And why do we need that is because not everything in the world is Boolean, right? Some things are. Sometimes you want to reason about integers, maybe strings, um, sets, and things like that. So, um, for example, I could encode the same problem in a bit more, you know, a bit more uh, faithfully uh, by basically saying, still, let's say G and tonic are still propositional variables, Boolean variables, right? But now other things are encoded as integers. So, for example, um, I say that uh, the same fact that minors can only get gin, I encode as if age is less than equal to 21, then actually less than, sorry, 
it should be less than 21, then uh, the alcohol by volume has to be zero. And then I know that my age is 17, obviously. I'm not very young. Um, then, um, and I also kind of relate the Boolean variables to the integer variable the same. Uh, if it's gin, then alcohol by volume has to be greater than equal to 40, because apparently that's the definition of gin in the US. Um, <laughs> I don't know, I saw it on the um, and then, so I can give this formula to an SAT solver, and it will again find a satisfying assignment, meaning uh, values for all the variables that make this formula true, right? So it will say, well, age has to be 17, that's what we said there, uh, hence alcohol by volume has to be zero uh, from the second clause, hence gene has to be false, um, and time has to be true. Okay, and this was, so um, here we only wanted to reason about you know, integers and kind of compare them to things. So, so this would be, a bit, in particular, a theory of linear integer arithmetic, which is a very popular theory in SMT saw Almost all scholars, I mean, all scholars support that, and they're very good at reasoning about that. But there are other theories you can use, like untrumpeted functions, arrays, um, and so on. So, so today, um, so now that we know a little bit about what those solvers are, right, I'm actually not going to tell you about how they work, right? So uh, as you can imagine, this uh, solving this uh, constraints involves some kind of search, right? And they and solvers are really good at doing the search efficiently, and this is why they're so good at you know helping us with our field research. So I'm not going to tell you about how they work. There are a lot of uh, you know nice talks about. It. That, uh, but I'm basically just going to tell you how to use them, right? So there are several you know, popular sol solvers out there that um, that people can just use out of the box without even knowing really how they work. Um, Z3 from Microsoft Research is probably the most popular one because it's it might not be the fastest in any particular domain, but it's reasonably good across domains. So um, if you don't have any specific requirements, that's probably what you would use, and it's open source and, and, and really available. Um, there are CVC4 uh, that does some of the things faster. I don't know much about the eyes, and uh, bool vector is recently very popular if you want to, uh, if your constraints only involve bit vectors and not like integers or functions. Um, and then it's very fast. So, why, uh, what makes it very easy for you to use those different solvers is that um, they all have a standardized input format that's called SMT Web. Um, it's this kind of uh, you know, list blank format. Um, the cool thing is that if you if your tool generates constraints, if you can translate your um, problem into constraints expressed in SMT Web, you can interchangeably use any of the solvers, and then we. Uh, and then on top of that, um, something that's worth knowing is that there is this annual, I believe, uh, SMT competition where you know all those different solvers compute on you know a uh, common set of benchmarks. And so by looking at the results of the competition, you can see what is the new hot solver this year and you know use that one. Okay. So okay. So today, um, for the rest of this talk, I'm basically going to give you like a, a, a demo of how to use C3 uh, if you want to do some of these uh, kind of PL-ish tasks like constraint programming, um, program verification, and program synthesis, right? So we're just going to build, we're basically going to build like a program verifier and a program synthesizer right here, right now, together, but um, because we only have half an hour, we're going to build it for a, just one problem. It, it's only going to solve one problem. Right, so what's this problem going to be? It's going to be array partitioning. Um, the problem is uh, how to partition an array of size n evenly into p subranges. So this problem is obviously quite simple if n is divisible by p, right? So if n is a over p is 4, then obviously the size of each partition should be just n over p, right? That's not very difficult. But if n is not divisible by p, then it's just a little bit more difficult, so maybe the naive solution that first comes to mind is, well, we can um, assign n over p to the first p minus 1 partitions, 
and then uh, all, the whole leftover goes to like the last partition. But then, unfortunately, the last partition can be like significantly larger than everything else, right? And <coughs> this is what we kind of mean by partition evenly. So we don't want this to happen. So what would be like example of uh, a domain where this is relevant, where where this would be useful to get this like even partition? Genetics. Genetics? How so? I, I, I don't know. <laughs> okay, I mean, research allocation, I heard from there. So, yeah, if you're, if, if you're trying to do some kind of uh, work allocation, you're processing this array in parallel, multiple uh, threads, right? You, you want to give each thread sort of an even amount of work to do. And if you partition your work like this, then your last thread will be stuck for a long time partitioning the, uh, processing this last, you know, big piece of the array, right? We don't. Um, so what we would like to do is, uh, so in this case, perhaps, instead of like 2, 2, 2, 4, we would like to get 2, 2, 3, 3, right? And in general, um, can we always partition it in such a way that the sizes differ by at most one? You know, and um, if we can, then how do we, you know, figure out how much to allocate to each partition? You know, what's the formula? What's the program? You know that. That's all right. So, so this is a problem that we're going to solve with um, um, with an SMT solver. So, let me switch to the demo now. Um, all right. This was my next slide. Z3 to <laughs> Okay, can everyone see the code? Yes, I'm left. Okay. Um, so, right. Oh, yeah. What I'm going to say is that you can use um, the solvers through this SMT lib format, right? But it's not very easy to like type by hand because it has all these parentheses. Uh, so, there are a lot of nice bindings for different programming languages uh, so that you can write code in your favorite programming language and talk to the solver, right? So there are uh, obviously uh, C, C++ bindings for Z3, which is like the original thing. There are Haskell bindings that you can use, and I also use in my work. But because I'm a trader, and I should never be allowed to use CFP anymore, um, I'm, I'm not going to be using those. I'm going to be using Python bindings today uh, because they're just like slightly nicer. Um, has a lot of operator overloading, so it almost looks like you're writing like a normal program, but you're actually talking to the solver. Um, okay, so let's do this in Python. So um, we need to we want to write this program that um, figures out what those sizes of the partitions should be, right? For um, i for indices in range. You know, like in, uh, from zero to p minus one, right? Okay. So we could, what we could do is we could like think really hard what to put here, right? So what the size should be. Or if we don't want to think hard at all, we can just ask C3, right? So to do that, to enable this um, amazing power, we're gonna import Z3 library, right? So I will say from Z3, import everything. Um, and then at this point, instead of actually figuring out what expression should go here, um, I can make all those sizes be symbolic variables that um, Z3 will figure out for me, right? So basically to do that, I'll have to say each one of those sizes is going to be an integer symbolic variable, and I have to give it a name, so I'll say it's called size um, i. Okay, so now we have you know p of those symbolic variables, and now what we can do is we can um, so we can create a solver that's going to solve things for us, right? And now what we're going to do is we're going to assert constraints on those symbolic variables that we want to hold, and then ask the solver to you know figure them out, uh, figure out the sign. Okay, so the constraint that that was really important for us is that the partitions should all differ by at most one. Right? So we can um, write this fairly easily. Let me copy paste this for i in range p because it's going to be, I'm going to repeat that a lot. Um, so we want to say that uh, for each i and j in, uh, from uh, 0 to p minus 1, um, basically, so then we add this constraint to the solver, and the constraint is going to be that. Um, 
the size of i uh, minus the size of j uh, is less than or equal to 1. Right? And this is what we want to say um, because, you know, we compare the picture. So at this point, we can actually, before even asking the solver to solve it, we can actually look at the constraints that we just asserted. So we can print um, like the string representation of the solver. I believe we can do it this way. Let's see if this works. Right, so we got all these constraints, right? You see them on, on the right. So okay, now instead of uh, just printing the constraints, um, let's ask the solver to actually do this. So um, let's say, um, so we as the check um, does the, the actual checking, right? And it ret returns either sat satisfiable or unsat unsatisfiable. So if it returns satisfiable, we can then ask the solver for the model, and the model is the solution, right? So so we want to print, uh, I believe it's a test, test. and otherwise we can like say the no solution. So at this point, uh, sure, the solution that we got is all zeros, right? And uh, indeed, they don't differ by more than one. But why did we get all zeros? Yeah. You didn't constrain it, and the sizes have, a, have to add up to the size of the list. Exactly. So we forgot the constraint that they should add up um, to the size of the list. So let's let's assert that. Um, so we will add the constraint. So there's this handy operator called sum. So we can sum all the sizes, uh, again, for i, maybe. Um, and that sum should be equal to n, right? No. No, I'm pretty sure. Can you sum symbolic? Yeah. <laughs> Wait, somehow it Oh, I think I forgot the list of So, okay, sum takes a list of symbolic functions, right? I forgot to put the list of the list of Yeah. Why is the list comprehension necessary then? Why can't you just put sums? <laughs> <laughs> to put what? Why can't you just put S straight in? Why is the list comprehension necessary? I mean, I could, I could just sum them. Um, isn't, isn't that list comprehension just reproducing the same array as said? Oh, yeah. so just it's, just pass it like this, yeah, yeah. perhaps, yeah, I, I guess so. That's. No, but that would be Um, okay, so we got, you know, three, two, two, three, right, which is what we expected, that um, we'll have, um, we'll have two twos and two threes, right, so, and we can play with, like, different numbers here to see if, you know, this is, uh, this seems to be, you know, always solvable and always possible, um, and it would, um, you know, it works. Okay, but now, um, so now we're thinking, okay, um, I think we've got kind of a hang of it. Um, so so what the, the problem with this uh, approach is that uh, every time you run your program, you have to solve constraints, right? And solving constraints is expensive, right? So um, so this was this is what I call like constraint programming or declarative programming, right? But at some point, if you actually figured out, you know, what the program is supposed to do, um, you can just, you know, write it down as an expression so that it can just uh, execute efficiently, right? But um, so here, what is going on? So so we uh, we see that. So what should the solution be, basically, right? So we see that um, we can assign, you know, n over p to some part of some of the partitions, right? And we can assign n over p plus one to some other partitions. And uh, we're just not quite sure, you know, where is the order? Like, where should we stop assigning n over p plus one and start assigning n over p, right? So we can again, like, think very hard and try to figure this out, or we can use kind of program synthesis 
like approach to uh, um, have the solver figure it out for us, right? So let me see if I can do that. Um, so um, let's say I introduce, uh, so, so, so these two constraints were kind of like our correctness constraints, right? But uh, now I will also introduce a constraint that actually um, kind of tells us what the implementation is going to be, like the kind of the implementation constraint. Um, and in this implementation constraint, um, um, let me just. Um, so in this implementation constraint, I basically I, I'll basically assert that size of i is equal to some expression, right? And then, um, but let's say I'm not exactly sure what this expression should be, right? I think this expression should be an if, and uh, if index is less than something, it should be n over p plus one, and if index is greater than like above that, then it should be n over p. But let's say I'm not exactly sure what this uh, number should be, right? Because so um, I'm thinking it may be a constant two because in our first solution there were exactly like two threes and then two twos. It might be um, n over p because in our case n over p was two, and it might be n mod p because that was also two. So it could be like any of those, right? Um, and I want to solve it, solve it to figure it out for me, right? So I will use this kind of like simple way of program synthesis. I will, what I'll, I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce um, uh, this thing called control variable, right? So I'm going to say I have an integer variable uh, called c, and basically depending on the value of the c, I will pick one of those three expressions that I think could go in there, right? So now instead of this, like putting some real expression in here, I will again put an if, and I'll say if c, for example, is zero, then I'm going to choose two, right? Otherwise, if um, c is, let's say, one, I'm going to choose um, n over p, and otherwise I'm going to choose n more p, right? And then depending on what the model, I have no idea how many, um, I think that's good. So, and depending on what the, mod, the solution for C is going to be, I'm kind of going to know uh, what expression to put there. Uh, but of course, it's, it will only be the case for, for this uh, particular N and P, right? So I'm going to find out what expression works for this N and P. Well, for N equals 10, it's kind of like, um, we don't even want to test that because we know that all three of them work for N, for N, is, 10, when N is 10. So we should test for something else. But let's first say um, we will print not not the whole um, model, but we'll say uh, we'll just print the value of c, right? So we'll print um, as the model evaluate c. So this is how you can uh, print like values of the projects. So and if indeed if it, if we test it for um, your type on line 16. Oh, right. Um, so, right, if you ask it for, uh, so it just says C because indeed for, for n equals 10, it doesn't matter, so it doesn't have a solid. So it's like, I don't know what C, whatever, C, I don't care. Um, so, but we, we can give it something else. So, for example, if we give it like 14. Um, it will tell us, well, C should be zero. So it basically told us, okay, so two, like just the constant two is a good solution, you know, to put in there. Um, but obviously if we put, um, you know, two in there, then this is not actually gonna work for all N, right? Um, but to test that, um, so basically now that the, the, the solver told us, okay, it should be two, I can actually, you know, replace this whole expression um, get rid of the C, replace this whole expression with the 2, and try to um, verify whether this solution actually works for all values of n, right? Because for now, we just know that it works for um, n is 14, right? Um, so if I do that, 
So how do I so, so how do I verify that, right? So um, for now, I mean, I know it works for n is 14, but to verify whether it works for all n, um, I would have to replace this n with actually a symbolic value and try to ask the solver whether it works for all n. You know, how to do that? Um, so if I, if I simply run it this way, right, it will simply find the n for which it works, right, which is not what we want. So in fact, so to do verification with the solver, meaning um, to ask you to verify that it works for all n, so uh, what we have to do is to in fact ask it to find us some n for which it does not work. Um, right, so to do that, we will have to replace our correctness constraints with uh, their negation. So we have to ask you to please find the n where this does not hold, right? But if, so we can just add not to all of those correct constraints. Unfortunately, if we just do it like this, we are asking it to find something where none of those constraints hold, right? So what we actually want to say is, find me where at least one of them does not hold, right? So, but we can do that by just uh, like testing them one by one and say, uh, ch check if this one might not hold, right? And then if you find an n where it does hold, you know, tell us, otherwise just continue. Right. So to do that, um, so we'll basically so add this constraint, right? And then here we will um, check if this is sap, right? We can like print something like um, long for um, n equals, and then we get the model of n. And then we just exit, right? We give up. And otherwise, we continue, right? But um, since we are adding all these constraints to the solver, we shouldn't be, you know, keep adding them. We just want to add them one by one, and add it, and then remove it, and, and then add the next one. So for that, we'll use this uh, push and pop uh, functionality of the solver. So when I say push, it kind of remembers its state, and then uh, I can add more constraints. And then when I say pop again, it like removes all these constraints and forgets about them. Right? And we'll do the same thing here. Um, if this one is satisfiable, we will say, you know, that it's wrong. Um, and exit. And otherwise, if we manage to get through all of this stuff, we'll just say print um, something like verified for all n, right? And uh, the benefit of also asserting those constraints one by one is that we can actually give better error messages. We don't have to say just wrong. We can just, we can say um, here like not similar. And here we can say does not add up or something like that. Right, because depending on the constraints, that's valid. Um, for all these inputs. 
and then at some point the verifier will tell us, you know, verify for all n. And I will put this this code online afterwards after we fix all these um, <laughs> errors so that you can test it at home by itself. So and basically by doing that you get um, um, this uh, architecture for program synthesis that's called counterexample counterexample guided um, inductive synthesis where you uh, first give the solver one input and then you try to synthesize the solution so the values of this control variables for one that work for one input then you give that resulting program to the verifier and either it happens to work for all n because you guess the solution and then you're done with uh, synthesizing the program or uh, the verifier says no it's wrong for some input and then um, you add this input to your set of inputs in which it should work and uh, give the resulting problem against the synthesizer and you go on until uh, either the synthesizer says that there doesn't exist such a pro uh, program or the verifier says it's verified. Okay, cool. So at this point, you know, I hope that you learned a little bit about, you know, how to use solvers for education and synthesis and straight programming and um, you will be able to much easier uh, start using them in your work. Thank you.